All right, everyone, let's get this thing started. Um, first off, I want to say thank you for everyone that has joined so far. It looks like we're still having a few people uh, joining. Um, this is, is your organization ready for Data Vault? We have two great speakers ahead of us. Uh, some of you guys are looking to potentially implement uh, Data Vault and seeing how your, what your organizations need to achieve a timely, cost-efficient, and successful implementation. Uh, and then the others might already have Data Vault I'm looking for new agile tips and tricks and approaches from a couple of experts. So let's go over to who will be speaking today. First, don't need too much of a bio. We have Dan Linstead, probably the reason why you guys are here. Uh, Dan is the inventor of Data Vault architecture and is a world renowned expert in data warehousing and business intelligence with over 25 years of IT experience. Uh, he's helped organizations including Fortune 50 companies like Nike, US Air Force, US Department of Defense, uh, American Automobile Association, the Jardins Bank, and a bunch of others uh, successfully implement business intelligence solutions. Uh, Dan offers Data Vault 2.0 certifications and co founded LearnDataVault.com to help spread the word and education about Data Vault and share his real world experiences. After him, we have Kevin Marshbank. Uh, Kevin is a Wearscape uh, senior solutions architect. He's helped people and organizations quickly automate their data warehouse initiatives from build out to continuous improvement and maintenance. Kevin teaches teams uh, to work in an agile method while increasing engagement with business and greatly improving their ability to leverage one of their greatest assets, their data. The topics that we are going to run through today is, first off, we have what are the benefits of employing Data Vault 2.0 for the enterprise and specifically for IT. And then next we got what does IT need to be successful in implementing Data Vault 2.0? And last, how can Data Vault automation increase IT's ability to succeed? Um, so let's get into the value and I will pass it over to Dan. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm Dan Linstead. For those of you that know me or know of me, uh, as, as I was introduced, uh, lots of experience in the field. So let's just get right into it, shall we, and uh, see where we can go here. So why Data Vault? Uh, before we step into the value of Data Vault, you might be wondering, if you've never done one, why should you get into Data Vault at all? Uh, well, if you have lots of issues uh, ranging from late deliverably delivery to non-shareable team resources, non-standardized ways of working. Perhaps you've got global teams or multiple split teams all working to different standards. Uh, and they all come up with different results that don't match, don't balance. Some of them have privacy built in, some don't. Some handle GDPR, some don't. You might have some issues that you want to address. Well, Data Vault 2.0 is a system of business intelligence that addresses people, process, and technology. From this perspective, we definitely want to address inconsistent and missing standards, constant re-engineering uh, to fit big data or GDPR or privacy concerns. Uh, maybe you've got uh, teams putting things into production where you've got a lot of bugs coming along uh, with your production releases that end up being a lot of rework or re-engineering in your solution. And these can be a constant problem. Uh, maybe you need to parse images and audio, or what do you do with video files? And, and you go to your teams and they say, well, we don't have a standard for that, or it doesn't fit in a common dimension or fact table. Uh, well, we could use Hadoop for that. Well, what does Hadoop do? So you really need to think about the people, the process, and the technology all combined. Uh, data Vault is so much more than just a a data model. A lot of people look at Data Vault and think, well, it's just a data model. And this is something that's a, a fallacy out there on the web today. Uh, sure, we have a data model that is a hybrid design between third normal form and star schema or dimensional modeling, if you know about that. Uh, but we have so much more to offer. Uh, data Vault really is a system of business intelligence that brings a methodology for your team, for your people, for your processes. Uh, that's consistent, that's repeatable, that's scalable. Uh, we focus on enterprise solutions and big data systems, uh, BI analytics systems that really span or hybridize 
your environment, uh, ranging from combining Hadoop to relational uh, access to cubes, all the way through end to end. What you really want is enterprise BI solutions that are end to end so that you don't have disparate answer sets. Um, in the methodology, we focus on repeatability and pattern-based components. And the reason why we need pattern-based components, and it's, again, beyond just the data model. The reason why we need pattern-based components is because, well, how do you get good at something? How do you become agile in your workspace? Well, it, I, I liken it to riding or learning how to ride a bicycle. You know, when you learn how to ride a bicycle, normally you start with training wheels and eventually the training wheels come off. But, and you might fall down a couple of times, but you need to know exactly how to ride a bicycle, how much speed you need, how to maintain your, your balance um, and how, how to pedal, right? And there's really only one way, but it's a pattern based learning component. So we take these life lessons from the standard universe and we bring them into business intelligence and analytics. And the reason why is we like consistency through the team builds. Now we also have this architectural feel uh, or architectural component. And when I say architecture, everybody immediately thinks only of systems architecture, but architecture is so much more than that. Uh, we need scalable architecture. We need data architecture, process architecture, people architecture. How do we increase our team size on demand? How do we share team resources from an idle team halfway around the world? Uh, I've got uh, some insurance companies that have global offices all over, China, Japan, US, uh, Asia, Europe, and so on. So how do they coordinate efforts, right? So architecture is a big part of Data Vault 2.0. And then of course the model. Um, and again, when I say model, everybody thinks of Data Vault models i.e. the common hub and spoke architecture there for the data model. But it's, it's so far beyond the data model. Uh, we, we have a model for sure, but we also have a process model. We have a model for gathering requirements. We have, to have a model for being agile, for improving the consistency of the team output and improving the performance of the team and being agile. So lots of things that we need to think about. So some of the benefits that we get when we do Data Vault properly, uh, when we stick to the standards, when we leverage the right tooling, when we put the, the, the right processes in place, uh, we get multi-team agility. And this is worldwide cross-spread. We get 360 degree enterprise vision of all analytics. It's not just data warehousing analytics. This includes your data scientist programs and your BI analytics run through deep learning anything that, that goes on in the BI and analytics landscape. Uh, we also focus on something called gap analysis of business effectiveness. And from that perspective, what we're talking about is being able to detect and produce the gaps that are in your business. So for instance, today, your business users might say, well, you know, uh, we believe that the business is operating this way. Uh, and, and a common example of, of something like that would be in a manufacturing system. They'll tell me, or they did tell me at Lockheed Martin anyway, uh, you know, you'll never see new contracts being produced by the manufacturing system. Uh, they should always be produced by the finance system. Why? Because you shouldn't build to a contract that hasn't been financed. Makes sense. Uh, it turns out that we, through the data sets and through Data Vault 2.0 and discovery, we're able to show them not just how many contracts were produced in the manufacturing system, uh, but which ones and what percentage and how often it happened. This is the gap analysis that we're talking about. Where are the broken business processes in your enterprise? And furthermore, what's the value of that broken business process? Cross program collaboration. We definitely want to talk about not just BI and analytics, but I've got a, a large bank in Australia who's been using Data Vault for seven years. And they're so successful with their processes in teams uh, that they now have used or leveraged the, the Data Vault methodology inside of their operational build life cycles. It doesn't mean that they're using the Data Vault model inside their operational systems. Uh, 
but they're using the methodology, they're using the architecture, they're using the standards, the ways of working, you know, and they have over uh, about 400 people in IT, including teams that are split offshore. Uh, accuracy and auditability is a big one. Adaptation to change without re-engineering. This all comes from the standards. This all comes from the rigor that we apply in the processes, um, not only the processes that we build, but the ability to uh, write automated testing and, or if you're lucky, generate the automated testing. So that leads into the next piece here. But without re-engineering, what are we talking about? That means we can absorb a brand new system and new data sets, whether it's uh, real-time feeds or batch feeds, whether it's Twitter feeds, Google feeds, customer sentiment analysis, doesn't matter where it comes from. We can absorb these feeds and enrich our existing BI and analytics solutions, including the results of data mining and, and operations in say R, for example, uh, and enrich everything we have in our analytics without re-engineering the model or the processes. We simply add on or increment, uh, build incrementally um, to, to produce new BI solutions. Okay, so automation and generation is a big one. And of course, big data and NoSQL compatibility. I've been talking a little bit about the um, hybridization of data vault. Now, if you're wondering, are you the only one? Are you the first one? Um, I, I just wanna say no. <laughs> you're, not, you're not the first ones out there to think about data vault. You're certainly not the, 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 the only ones out there. We have 10 years of research and design inside of data vault 2.0 uh, from 1990 to 2000, plus another 15 plus years from then till now of successful deliveries around the world. Uh, we have 30,000 test cases uh, against the system, not just the data model, but the processes that go on, the maturity of the processes and the maturity of getting data out, producing cubes, producing analysis results, producing dashboards and on and on and on. All of these ways of working are backed by the grandfather of Agile called SEI, CMMI, that is Software Engineering Institute Capability Maturity Model and, and Discipline Agile Delivery. I partner with Scott Ambler. He is one of the founding fathers of the Agile Manifesto and uh, he and Mark Lines co-created Discipline Agile Delivery, which we leverage inside the methodology. Six Sigma is an error reduction strategy, a monitoring and measuring strategy. And then of course, TQM, total quality management is a big part of the methodology. And that isn't just about the processes that we produce into production and the errors that get, that get put there uh, and how do we fix them, but it's also the quality of data and it's the quality of the business processes. At the end of the day, to provide maximum ROI, we wanna focus on how do we expose the gaps of the broken business processes and how do we fix them? And we have over 6,000 worldwide practitioners. Um, that in itself really doesn't say a whole lot. It all depends on how good they are, really. Um, but we do have an awful lot of practitioners out there that are working in the data vault landscape today. Uh, banking, insurance, telco, governments, healthcare, manufacturing. If you want to know about specific uh, case studies, feel free to ask and, and I'll go through it. Uh, so we're going to move on now and talk a little bit about what uh, your IT team might need to succeed in the data vault landscape. And, you know, the title of this presentation is, are you ready for data vault 2.0? I would tend to say, if you've got disparate answers, you're probably ready. If you've got multiple teams worldwide all running to different beats and none of them are synchronizing and what they produce doesn't line up, doesn't, and they're still building silos or things like this nature. Uh, if, if one team is successful in the cloud, but another one can't seem to get there, you've got some issues with the people, you've got some issues with your practices, then Data Vault 2.0 can help, okay? So we focus on standards, best practices, and skilled agile leadership. Uh, we also focus on continuous improvement, continuous build. We're not talking months, we're not talking years, and in some cases, we're not even talking about weeks uh, to build a single deliverable. In some cases, we can get a single deliverable through the Data Vault 2.0 solution and out to the BI uh, environment on the dashboard 
in a matter of hours or days. So measurement and rigor are a big part of this. How did we do what we do? Did we succeed in what we did? Uh, did we fail? Did our estimates not meet our actuals? Why? Uh, and how can we improve it? And that's a big part of the agile system. And then of course, the technology side of this, we're talking about flexible templates. And this is where Wearscape comes in. They've got a number of flexible templates. We definitely want a set of well-founded standards to work from. And uh, we provide those standards in the Data Vault 2 landscape, but there are some customizations that need to happen on site for certain sets of data. I mean, templates at the end of the day are great uh, for 90% of what you need to do, and you should stick to the standards as much as possible. But there's anywhere between 5 and 10% of minor modification that needs to occur on site for certain things. You definitely want a metadata driven approach. Uh, and along with the end-to-end -end control. Having a metadata-driven approach and a repository allow you to leverage these components and uh, execute with version control. Wizard-driven generation, that's an accelerator for your team. So just a couple of sample examples here. I've got a retailer that built in two days what took their outsourcer three months after they'd been trained in Data Vault 2.0 and engaged in automation. Um, I've got another insurance corporation that built in one week what used to take them six months. Same number of people and same exact amount of work. But instead of six months, we've optimized it with automation and they built it in a week. Um, I've got a big bank that now builds in two hours what used to take them two weeks. And that is a team of about 20 people. Uh, that build in two hour life cycle. So how would you like to get from the time you give your IT team a requirement to the time that you produce into production? How would you like that turnaround time to be two hours? Do you think your users will try to go around you or go with you and go through you and, and actually increase your backlog if you're a two hour turnaround? So executing successfully in order to get the automation end goal, you definitely need a couple of pieces to make that happen. You need standards and rigor. You need good practices. You need people to follow good practices. You can't build willy-nilly and you can't afford to have multiple global parallel teams all running around doing different things and following a different drummer. It doesn't work. So you also have to have a desire to do things differently. I'm sure you've heard the old adage, um, you know, um, if you do the same thing over and over again, uh, you know, that's basically you're going to end up where you're headed. You're going to recreate the mess that you have today. And I'm, I'm a little bit sad to see that this is actually happening in the industry. People are saying, oh, we'll just load a data lake or data dump and we'll go back to rogue development. We'll let freeform development take place. This is all this self-service BI with no rigor, no governance, no PII or private information protection. Uh, no standards, and we'll just stick a team on it. We'll write some R code and produce a result, and we'll call it good enough. This uh, is what led to the problems that we had with all of the star schemas before. If you can think about this, this was related to loading a stage area and letting people go willy-nilly build dashboards on top of stage areas, and we ended up with all kinds, all kinds of information silos. So you have to want to do things differently in order for Data Vault 2 to succeed. It's a culture change. And then we have training and then we have collaboration as well. These are all big parts of how Data Vault can help. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed uh, my part of the presentation. Thanks, Dan. Uh, at this point, we'll stop for a minute. And uh, Ursh, do we have any questions that uh, people have submitted for Dan? Yeah, we do. Uh, we actually, the first question is, should we let business users, users query for Data Vault directly? That was the first question we got. Okay. The answer to that question is, uh, it depends, but let me qualify. So if you have a power user that actually needs to query the raw data in the Data Vault, absolutely you have to give it to them. However, that does not mean that they should access the raw structure itself what you should be doing is putting together a, at least one layer of views and then allowing them to access that layer of views 
uh, to get the data out. And, and certainly these power users or these data scientists will want that. And then sometimes the views don't perform. So you have to uh, do a couple of things like pits and bridges or point in time and bridge tables. And then of course, the last piece there that you need to be considerate of is security of the data. Uh, and security of the data might mean PII protection, privately identifiable information. Uh, it might mean GDPR compliance, general data protection, privacy regulations. Uh, so from that perspective, the answer is uh, no. We never let them hit absolutely direct the raw structures. Uh, but the answer is yes, we do deliver the raw data to them uh, if they can prove a need. Okay, and then our next question is, what are the biggest blockers organizations encounter trying to implement Data Vault? Uh, the first and foremost is a lack of understanding. Uh, people try to do it on their own um, and they do sometimes succeed, especially if they've had somebody who has been through training before and that is qualified or certified Data Vault 2 training. Um, the, the, the second is uh, is just assuming that Data Vault is just a data model and taking the hub and Lincoln satellites out of the entire context and merely implementing it. Uh, the third is breaking of the standards. If they break the standards, those things can cause serious problems. And I would have to say the fourth, um, and, and these are all number one issues on the list. Just because I'm listing them off in a particular order does not mean they're not equally important. They all are equally important. But the, the fourth thing on the list is automation. You've got to have some form of automation and acceleration that enables you to stick to the standards and do more with less. Perfect. Well, thanks, Dan. I appreciate that. Uh, we'll go ahead and jump in here and talk about uh, the automation aspect and the tech technology part of the three pillars, the methodology, architecture, and model. Uh, you know, and that is, if you go back and think about what Dan was talking about there with the people, the process, and the technology as we walk through this, that really applies throughout this process. Uh, Wearscape is metadata driven. We have a metadata repository that tracks uh, your objects, your uh, design, uh, all the way down to data types and documentation. Uh, either that you've entered or it's extracted from your source system. Also, uh, built in best practices for Data Vault 2.0 in our partnership with Dan, uh, built best practices, practices and industry standards around that, and always keeping the documentation and the data lineage up to date. Uh, again, uh, Dan mentioned Scott Ambler and the disciplined agile delivery. Uh, part of that process is focusing on consumable solutions, not just potential, potentially shippable software. And that's part of what you'll see during this process and that full lifecycle management moving from just an iteration of development of code to actually um, going and delivering something in each cycle. So a couple of uh, customer success stories, Aptus Health, uh, and again, going back to the examples that Dan gave, again, we have many of those examples with our customers uh, moving from a SQL Server on-premise solution to Snowflake in the cloud using uh, Data Vault automation with Wearscape. They were able to create their first Data Vault design in three days and then move into production Data Vault within Snowflake in three months. And that's fully documented. That's not just a warehouse that's considered production, but now it's you've got to go through the process of making it available to your end users. But this is fully documented, ready for, as you can see on the far right uh, with Aptus, be able to uh, implement Power BI, Tableau, and giving your data scientists access to the documentation to move forward with design immediately. Also Micron, uh, one of the largest, if not the largest Data Vault 2.0 implementation in the world uh, using Wearscape automation on top of Teradata, implemented their global data warehouse within 90 days, the foundation for that and they're able to deliver new data warehouse prototypes in less than an hour. Um, being in a manufacturing facility, they uh, spin up new warehouses for new lines and things like that. Uh, one of the other advantages with Wearscape is it's not a black box. We expose everything and are fully transparent in the code that it generates. And again, you get consistency and uh, improve speed with your teams. Uh, Vodafone, uh, another customer, 
uh, on Data Vault uh, with Warescape Automation on Teradata, save costs by being able to decommission an existing ETL solution. And uh, you save on licensing and hardware costs with that, as well as at the same time, accelerating their time to production from six months to two days, which is an incredible improvement uh, turnaround. Also, because Warescape generates code for the platform that you choose to use, you can take advantage of the power of your platform and they were able to reduce, for instance, their load time by 90%. And we see this over and over again, regardless of the platform that you choose, uh, just like Data Vault 2.0, we're platform agnostic. We will write the code native to your platform. If it's Snowflake, we'll write Snow SQL. If it's SQL Server, we'll write SQL for uh, SQL Server, Azure DW, uh, DB2, et cetera, uh, whichever platform you'd like to use. Wordscape Data Vault Express is a combination of two of our main products, 3D and RED. It generates uh, your hubs, satellites, and links automatically, your hash keys, your change keys, um, all your metadata attributes, and also generates the code to instantiate and load that data vault. So what we'll do is we'll take a quick look at Data Vault Express. I'll jump right in here to Wearscape 3D, the design modeling tool. Now I've already modeled a source system, and we can see real quick here the source model, nice beautiful source model. Not all of your sources will be like this. We provide uh, wizards to generate your keys, and find your relationships. Um, also, ability to profile the data and quickly look at uh, what's gonna be of use to your analyst. And here we can see quickly that uh, ship region is mostly null, that won't have a lot of analytical value. But this is a good quick uh, design to do a data-driven approach to see what's in the system. We also have model conversion rules that will automatically generate this into a data vault, but that is of, limited value in the sense that it'll give you get you 60% of the way there possibly with um, giving you a good idea of what your vault should look like. But really from a Data Vault 2.0 perspective, you need to be having those conversations with your business. And in that, build out your logical model and source your source system into these entities. If we look at the shippers entity here and trace the source, we can see that's coming from the shippers table in the source orders connection and being and then populating that logical entity. So I've had the conversations with the business, I've marked business keys, I've marked units of work, uh, as well as my attributes. And I've talked with them and we're missing the customer's entity at this moment, so I'm gonna bring that in. And even with the customer sitting right next to me, I can pull up this and ask them, how do they view the customer? What is the actual business key? Now the source system says the customer ID is the primary key, but that's not necessarily the business key and how the customer views the business. They've told me as we walk through this, the, the company name is actually the business key and um, is how they refer to their businesses or their companies and that it's always gonna be unique. Also in discussions about the attributes of the company, they've told me that the contact name and the contact title change fairly frequently. So I'm gonna mark that as a medium volatility attribute. And then the rest of these are low volatility. They don't change very often, especially that fax number there at the bottom. So we'll go ahead and mark those. And now we see those colors uh, marked here to show how we've identified these various attributes. I'm also gonna take the company name and link that over to the customer's entity. And now we have the logical model split out here to uh, add this additional entity that the customer said they needed. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this logical model at this point, and I'm going to take an advanced copy of this and create a data vault using this logical model. Give it a version of 3.0 and apply a model conversion. Now, part of the power in this tool set around uh, data governance and really that process that uh, Dan was talking about is creating these model conversions that apply your standards. Again, you need to have that flexibility. We provide some of these out of the box, but they all can be modified and customized. We have a set of uh, model conversions here that generate your data vault for you based on that logical model, but you can actually add your own uh, customizations if you wanna apply naming standards to how this is built, you can do that as well. I'm gonna go ahead and kick that off and let that run. 
And it's going to go through and read that logical model and make the determinations on what the data vault should look like based off the keys and the relationships. And if I display this now and then reorganize it here so it looks a little prettier on the screen, we now have a data vault model based off of our discussions with the business. We have our satellites and our links with our hash keys defined, our hub hash keys, our link hash keys, etc. If I look down here at the customers, you can see that I, it's taken the uh, attributes that have been marked as uh, slowly changing, as low rate of change satellite, along with a change hash for that particular set. And then for the medium rate of change attributes, the contact name and title, it has split that out into a separate satellite as well. Now, some of our customers choose to split that out uh, also based off of HIPAA data or PII data to be able to secure that off. You can do that. You can apply model conversions to automatically split. You can mark your attribute types and have the model conversions split those satellites out for you, uh, depending on whether it's financial data, healthcare data, uh, et cetera. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this uh, model now that we've built off the uh, logical model, built the raw vault. We're going to build a deployment, which is going to generate load and stage uh, objects for us. So I'm going to apply this model conversion here, and it's going to walk through, and it's going to look at the source, and it's going to look at the target uh, data vault model, and it's going to go through and build out the load tables to be able to land that data. It's going to build the stage tables as well as the hash key definitions for your various satellites for your rates of change all across the attributes as well as your hubs, your hub hash keys. And do all that work ahead of time so that we can follow this insert only no update approach to loading the vault which is lends itself very well to uh, streaming data, uh, slow changing data, all of that is supported in the Data Vault 2.0 methodology. So now that we've built that, if we take a look at what has occurred, it has brought over that Data Vault model that we already looked at, but it's also built these stage tables as well as these load tables. And again, uh, this can be on whichever platform that you're operating on. And if we take this now and export this to Wearscape Red, here's that integration to take you from that design and modeling over to your actual build out. Now here you can uh, have multiple targets, you can have different platforms involved, and there's various in here, but it identifies that this particular version I'm doing is SQL Server, and it's also applying a mapping to SQL Server. And what it's gonna do at this point is generate a deployment package. So it's gonna take all these objects in the model and dump this to an XML deployment on my file system here. And then what I can do is load that in to my actual metadata repository. So I'm going to go ahead and run this and it's going to walk through the manifest from that 3D model that we built out. And it's going to tell me what it's going to replace and what it's going to create new. Also, if there was existing items, what it's going to alter. We have a lot of options here. This is a deployment settings uh, wizard. And you can actually create your settings and export those and you can use Jenkins. Some of our customers use Jenkins to automate, automate these deployments. And now what it's gonna do is update the metadata repository with all the information that we uh, did in our design. And then once it's done with that, Red will start creating those objects in the target platform and also bring over the comments and add those comments into your target platform. However, it supports embedded comments. It will put those into your target platform as well as store it in your metadata. So now that I've done that, I'll bring up our builder tool, Wearscape Red. And if I refresh this and expand this out, I now have my hubs and my links and my satellites actually built on my target platform along with my load tables and my stage tables. Now the ones that are in green, I had already created. They're on a different target, uh, pulling from web services and blob storage, et cetera. If I take my customer's uh, table here and load that, it's gonna dynamically generate in my settings an SSIS package, execute that and load that. And I can look at the data pulled over from that particular source. Now, if I go to my stage table, I'll go ahead and generate the code. Again, it's generating code for my target platform. In this case, that's SQL Server, so it's building SQL Server store procedures using templates, 
which again, again can be modified. I'm going to execute that. You can see how quickly that, uh, that executed because it's executing in my target platform. Uh, just took milliseconds to execute and load the data. Now we're off, now that we're on the warehouse and you can see that it's generated my hash keys, a hub hash key, as well as my change hash keys. I have two of those on here before the low rate of change and medium rate of change, as well as some of the data vault 2.0 standards with your source, uh, source system being pulled through. So I'm going to go to my hub customers and I'm going to generate the code for that to load it. And then I'll execute that. And that quickly, I now have a populated hub uh, table. And then if I look at my satellites, I have my two satellites here with the low rate of change and the uh, medium rate of change satellite. So I'll go ahead and build the code for those. And then I will execute the update and display the data. And now I've loaded a satellite. I've got my hash key with my attributes as well as my change hash and my source columns. So that's all, all well and good, but some of the other things that this is doing for you while we're walking through this is it's maintaining the documentation. If I do a track back diagram, I can see here that I have my customer's source, my load customers, stage customers, and my uh, satellite customers on top of that. I can also build a diagram of my vault. If I go to my hub tables, grab customers for instance, and go out eight levels and look at my links diagram, here is my fully created data vault set of objects. I have my hub customers, my links, uh, my satellites, et cetera. And this is interactive. I can double click on these and actually work on the procedures and the properties, et cetera, within the tool set. I can also build out a job from here to populate this. Also very easily from here, I can go up and do doc, create documentation to build out an external website. And if I click all, all objects, it'll give me a few options about where to create this. Uh, give it a header, a title, and it's gonna walk through and generate that website for me. And pull in all of those diagrams and split out the uh, documentation between user and technical documentation. If I click on user documentation here, we can quickly look at my objects here. I've got a glossary now generated with all of my metrics and my attributes defined, object name defaults. So here again, if we talk about um, that consistency and pattern based, we have our standards in here for our users to see. I can look at uh, fact tables. If I'm looking through here, I can look at the star schema and link over to the dimensions. I have some sample uh, queries to start me off and also linking over to my dimensions. But what's really great is uh, the technical documentation. So if we want to look here, uh, same documentation, but now if we look at the hubs, for instance, I can look at hub customers that we're just working on. We have a lot more information. We have uh, relationships to find, source to target mapping. We have our data lineage. We have our spine diagram, which is our hubs and links embedded in here. Any indices, depending on your platform, it may create indices for you automatically, which you can turn on or off hierarchies and aggregates, but what's really great, again, that uh, transparency, we can actually look at the code in the documentation that it generates. So quickly, we can have a fully fleshed out set of documentation, which also, also helps protect against uh, your, uh, or, or help with employee churn. As employees churn over, you have this full documentation that's up to date to bring uh, people back in and be able to read through what uh, has been done and uh, use that and get on board on board very quickly. Yeah. So hopefully that uh, gave you a good overview to see how automation is going to help cut that complexity to get into your first data vault or to really increase the speed and reduce your project risk by increasing the time or reducing the time to, to uh, move through your projects and deliver something usable to your data scientists and your report developers and your analysts and really automate for speed. Again, this is everything you saw there. You're not uh, boxed in. You can uh, change the templates and modify it. So uh, any other questions out there for Dan or I at this point? 
Ursh, do you see any questions in the FAQ? I'm checking right now. Well, we have, looks like we have one for Dan. Say, so Dan, what do you think is the first stage in an implementation of Data Vault 2.0? And where do teams start to see the first, first see the benefits? Sorry, I was on mute there. Uh, okay, the first stage for Data Vault 2.0 implementation is really uh, two ways to engage. Uh, one is the kickstart, which is three days of training followed by seven working days of execution. And in reality, uh, in kickstarts that I've done in the past within the first week, which is three days of training followed by two days of execution, we have output in a development environment uh, capable of being reviewed by a business analyst. Uh, it doesn't mean the data is correct. It just means we've got data flowing all the way through. Uh, so this is the about the shortest time period that I've seen in building. On the other hand, in other organizations where trained uh, resources exist, uh, who have worked with Databolt 2.0 for a while uh, and maybe have uh, worked on a team where someone has been trained, uh, we can do something in as little as a day. Uh, and I did this recently with a, a company called NetJets uh, and helped them. They had a data vault underway uh, that was working, but their team agility was a little bit uh, slow from their management perspective. Came in and inside of uh, one day, we had solved a problem uh, all the way through with output uh, that was taking a manual process uh, that originally took, uh, I think it was 14 hours for one person to do. We automated everything uh, and, and built the code inside of one day. And uh, a few minutes later, we had that done. So that's sort of how quick people can get something done. It all depends on the scope. And this is a critical piece. Now, I just want to reiterate one last piece to this question, and that is just because you scope it way down doesn't mean it's throwaway work. It, uh, Data Vault is incremental in its build life cycle. So whatever we build, sorry, somebody's moving tables or walking around out there. Um, whatever we build, whatever we build is leveraged in the next uh, sprint cycle. Ed. Next question we have is, once generated, where does the code uh, reside? Assume SQL Server. Yeah, so depending on your platform. So in the, in the example or the demo I walked through, it was SQL Server. It was building SQL Server store procedures. Again, if you're on Snowflake, it's going to write code for that platform and let that platform execute it. Uh, the whole, uh, you know, the whole mantra behind Wearscape is we're going to take advantage of your target platform. We're going to write code for that platform, whatever it is. Thank you, Kevin. And then uh, another question is, is there a scheduler component to Wearscape? Yes, there's a, a great scheduler component. It uh, lets you run up to 50 threads at a time in one job. And so uh, built into the tool set, uh, you saw when I was showing the data lineage diagram, I can simply go up to the top and say create job and it'll generate a job using that data lineage and put the tasks in the order and it'll uh, put the steps in uh, that it can in parallel. So you can put in however many threads you can run parallel into the job and just let it go and it'll run through and uh, uh, run those steps. And the scheduler also, because this is metadata driven, you have a lot of additional options over just simply executing code. You can actually in the scheduler drop tables, recreate the tables, you can run stats, drop indexes, re-add them, et cetera. And then another question is, in the customer example, uh, multiple systems could feed their customers to the same hub. Can you give some insight how, into how it looks? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so when you have multiple sources feeding a particular object, uh, that's, we call that uh, multi-source mapping, and that's supported both in 3D and uh, the model, in the design portion as well as in the build portion and it will retain full data lineage. Those diagrams that I uh, pulled up will show the split out of the sources that are feeding those particular hubs. And this part of the Data Vault 2.0 methodology as well is that where those business keys exist, you should be populating the hub. Uh, 
And those model conversion rules will try to bring those business keys it finds that are identical from the source into the same hub and load it using multi-source mapping. So you will see when you do a track back diagram, you'll see that lineage back and the multiple sources feeding that particular hub. Okay. And then next question is, uh, does Wearscape support logical views to build dimensions facts from the data vault? Absolutely, yeah. So we also, you can uh, create templates to design those however you would like. We have some templates, for instance, that will uh, create a view on top of the satellites to get the current, uh, most current record out of the satellite. Uh, and you can also, if you have variations for, we have a customer that has come up with some uh, modifications to their data vault implementation. And within 3D, the design tool, they've customized the object types. So you saw the hubs, links, and satellites in there. You can create your own entity types and modify them to uh, change how you have your hash keys generated. You can change the design. And at that point, you uh, that's been automated. You Once you've changed the design or added to it and changed your code in the templates, now Wearscape continues to automate those changes for you. You can also have variations where you have different templates for different scenarios and use the automation to uh, bring that through. And again, that you end up with that consistent, repeatable pattern. You are QA teams for customers. A lot of times they stop focusing on QAing the code that's generated and they just QA the templates. Once they've QAed the templates, they don't have to worry about the code generation any longer. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, next question is, is there a way to load the data from source directly to the staging tables without utilizing load tables? And if so, how might, how might that look? There's different methods for doing that. Uh, typically, we follow the ELT approach, uh, especially because in Data Vault 2.0, and we've been kind of following that approach for a long time. You want to land that data first. Uh, you don't have to use a stage table in between if you don't want, uh, but we land the data into load tables primarily. Now, we can create view layers that pull directly out of the source, but typically we uh, suggest landing the data raw into the landing environment and then pushing that data raw into your raw vault and then you modify it into your business vault, applying your business rules, your logic, uh, creating your pit tables, your bridge tables, also applying your business rules. Now, initially, part of this process to be agile and move through this quickly, you want to create a raw vault, a raw mart off of your raw vault initially so that your business users can see that data quickly without the business rules applied, and then you can iterate and add those business rules later. Next question is, is Wearscape integrated with source control systems the similar, uh, the similar way Looker BI is? So we have a built-in uh, lightweight version control system that lets you uh, compare uh, versions of procedures or scripts that you've built over time. You can also uh, pull up previous versions of objects in the system, uh, as well as in uh, 3D, the design tool, you can have create multiple versions of models. And we I, that's one thing that I really work with customers on is to work quickly, to not get bogged down in analysis paralysis and actually make a quick copy of a model uh, version, create a new version, work on it. If it doesn't work, delete it and start over. Uh, these tools really let you iterate quickly. The uh, Some of our customers take and ex drop the data. There's functions within the tool set to drop the DDL and DML, the scripts, as well as uh, the models to uh, the file system. So XML models, you can actually actually export those to the common where, warehouse meta models, so you can import them to Irwin. We've also allow you to import back from Irwin, uh, Power Designer, et cetera. But uh, some customers impl implement that with Git or TFS. And uh, also, there's not a direct integration. We allow you to drop to disk and, and check those in and out as well as some customers have uh, created some automation with Git when they check out and imports them, the models directly back into 3D. And then direct Git integration uh, is coming in the next few releases. I believe, I believe that's slated for 2019. Okay, and let's see, we have one more question uh, that we can go through that we have time for. Um, let's see, if our team has already started building a data vault manually, how can the existing objects be simulated into Wearscape implementation? Uh, you mentioned Erwin. Is ER Studio also supported? So there's a common uh, warehouse meta model you, that you can export to and import that into 3D. 
Uh, but also we have actually have a large customer uh, insurance company in uh, Canada that had a large uh, existing data vault implementation that was populated using their uh, existing ETL tool set from their legacy system. And we have a couple of methodologies you can use to import an existing warehouse. You can model that into 3D and then push that back into Warescape. Uh, you, we also have what's called a retro functionality. You point that to your existing system and ingest those uh, objects and basically reads out the metadata from your existing warehouse and creates the metadata within 3D and then, or sorry, within Warescape Red, the builder tool. And then uh, for in, in the case of this insurance company, they all their new sources that they have, they have three new sources over time and they're using Warescape to uh, build the, the load and ingestion process and load that existing vault model and add to the existing vault model from those new source systems. So their existing ETL from the legacy system, that legacy system will die on the vine over time. And they're just letting that ETL it continue to execute outside of Warescape into that existing vault. And Warescape's managing all the new sources that they've added and ingesting that. Any other questions, Ursh? I think that was the last one that we could go through with time. Okay, well, thank you everybody. We appreciate your time. And uh, again, a big thank you to Dan Linstead for taking time out of his busy schedule. We appre appreciate his expertise and I always enjoy listening to him. And I appreciate everybody's time. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone. We'll get, and if you guys had additional questions, uh, we'll get back to you uh, directly.